Okay, well, let's get started. Um, welcome to what is the last panel of uh, what has been a fascinating conference on how global economic networks can be used uh, for the purposes of coercion by powerful states. This is uh, an unusual panel in that two of our speakers are participating remotely, but we hope the technology uh, works and can facilitate an interesting discussion. Before we begin the panel, I would like to thank uh, a couple of people. First of all, uh, Dan for entrusting me with uh, organizing all of the logistics of this conference and uh, to all of the students who uh, graciously volunteered their time to help ensure the success of this event. Um, this discussion uh, is on resistance and reaction to weaponized interdependence. Uh, it has been said quite a few times throughout the conference that uh, some attempts at decoupling from uh, these networks, uh, such as efforts at de-dollarization, uh, may not be particularly effective at countering weaponized interdependence, but others, such as the recent uh, splintering of the internet around the world, uh, are uh, increasingly becoming more prominent. Uh, so this panel will explore which spheres of the global political economy allow actors outside the center of these networks to become more resilient and undercut opportunities for coercion by the more central actors. Um, what are the weapons of the weak for resisting weaponized interdependence in world politics? Uh, so I will go ahead and introduce the panels. Uh, Panelists, first of all, uh, Thomas Wright, the director of the Center on the United States and Europe and senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy at Brookings Institution. Then we have Charlie Carpenter, professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Anastasia Likachova, uh, the director of the Center for Comprehensive European and International Relations at the Higher School of Economics and the Deputy Dean for Research at the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs at HSE. You my longest title. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we have Amrita Narlikar, the president of the uh, GIGA um, German Institute of Global and Area Studies. And her dog. dog. And her dog. <laughs> she is also a <laughs> Professor of International Relations at the University of Hamburg. Uh, so, without further ado, Thomas Wright. Thank you, Eric. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Eric, for, for facilitating us and to Dan uh, for facilitating uh, us via uh, webcast. Uh, and also, thank you to Dan and Henry and Abe for the invitation. I really wish I could be there uh, in person. I did catch uh, about two thirds, I think, of the sessions uh, via WebEx. So I hope I'm up to uh, speed uh, on, on most of what was discussed so far and it's been fascinating. What I wanted to do um, was try to take a little bit of a step back, um, which might be appropriate as the first uh, sort of speaker for this um, session and look at where it weaponized interdependence and the works elements of that um, hedging against that fits into the broader sort of national security picture I think governments are looking at. So to me, uh, what Henry and Abe have, have written about is uh, is a very important sort of subset of a larger you know, set of problems. And there's a, a context uh, there as well that has key dynamics. So I want to unpack those um, a little bit because um, as I look at it, what, what we're seeing in sort of the foreign policy space is this is being discussed not just as networks that can be weaponized, um, but also uh, uh, as a part of problems with openness in the international system. Countries and major powers are threatened by the extent of openness uh, in international order that's occurred over the last um, 25 years or so. And it's not just through um, the networks. And the reason why um, this is seen as threatening is largely because of the uptick in geopolitical rivalry. When this openness was proactively uh, organized and implemented, it was under conditions of not of necessarily of international comity or cooperation, but of acquiescence and, and really an absence of balancing 
Um, so there were differences, but it never really rose to the level of balancing. Balancing is back, rivalry is back, and I think that does change um, the dynamics. So we see it in the network space. We also see it in more traditional asymmetries of economic power, I think, as is the case between China and smaller uh, countries in East Asia. Uh, we see it in election interference. We see it in um, the, uh, what Russia is doing in the Middle East and, and what Turkey has done with weaponizing refugee flows. We see it in the espionage space in terms of what China is doing um, with big data. And all of these areas, I think, is really where rivalry and competition is going to go. So there's the risk of great power war in the background. But that's unlikely, I think, ever to actually happen. And the real sort of action will be on these other uh, measures and these other. So the question that leaders and, and uh, foreign policy folks are looking at really is, is less, um, is partly uh, decoupling, but it's really how to protect against the vulnerabilities of this openness and also how to exploit them, right? So you want to be defensive in terms of your vulnerability to others, and you also want to make sure you want to figure out how you can try to uh, exploit others' vulnerability, uh, partly to deter and partly uh, to gain uh, an advantage. Uh, I think the gravitational pull of this uh, problem is really uh, to, to begin to sort of close down some of the openness uh, that we see, and that's already um, begun to happen. I think partly it began in the Trump administration, but it's broader um, than that. I think as we look at the national security sphere, we also need to remember um, that there are other forces pushing for closing down that openness that are not national security related, right? So there are lots of people that want to uh, reduce the openness of the global economy, not because they're worried about China's national security advantage, but because they want to do so for their own sort of reasons uh, of domestic policy. And that may be good or bad, but it is arguably sort of a stronger force, maybe in some respects, than the national security um, motivation. So, for instance, if Elizabeth Warren were to be elected uh, president, we're likely to see a rolling back, uh, arguably, of, of the openness in the global economy, maybe of some of those uh, key uh, sort of elements on capital flows and other areas, and that won't be national security driving those um, decisions. Uh, similarly, if there was a violent repression in Hong Kong, you know, we'd see probably a change in Hong Kong status, so that would definitely reduce a sort of interconnection and interdependence between the US and China by removing Hong Kong's uh, role. And that wouldn't really be a national security thing. It would be a punishment of a, of a repressive act by China, as opposed to being seen as sort of a, a future uh, national security risk. So all of these things, I think, are reinforcing, and we see this in part in the debate on some of the Trump administration's uh, moves in that some of them are national security motivated and they have support domestically, including from Democrats. Others are, uh, are, are motivated by domestic politics and they have support from some of the national security hawks in China. And then the opposition as well can be reinforcing too. So I think all of this is is sort of mushed together. Uh, it's our job, I think, as analysts and as academics to try to disaggregate in some way, but I think it's pretty difficult uh, to fully um, disaggregate. I do think, as others have sort of noted in some of the previous panels, we do see efforts um, by China, by Russia, and by the United States to hedge against uh, this. I think the debate on how to is still at a very early stage, right? So to say that it's very difficult uh, to do, or the countries have decided not to go in certain directions, or that you know one belt one road may or may not be a way of hedging. It might not have been intended uh, in that way, and we don't really know how it's going to play out. Is accurate, but if we are year two or three or four of what could be a 10, 20, 25 year sort of rivalry, I think all of those things are very much on the table. So leaders and uh, and these and the like will be imaginative about how they hedge and they will um, they will, I think, begin to uh, create their own alternative um, networks as China, I think, has begun to do. They will uh, begin to wall themselves off from elements of collection as Russia has done since Putin returned to power, even if there's a large economic price for doing so. So they are recalculating sort of the economic cost benefit analysis, things that would have been a no brainer, you know, 10, 15 years ago are no longer no brainers because it's not just um, economics um, that really matters. And all of this will be shaped by rival 
rivalry, I think, will be the main um, sort of driver. Just a few other uh, points before I um, conclude. On the specific sort of decoupling debate, I think that this uh, this is a is a real debate now. You know, two years ago, um, I remember hearing this discussed in various policy forums, and it was dismissed as something that definitely would not happen. Now, really, the debate is the extent of it, and there are people who most people seem to believe that on technology in particular, there has to be uh, increased measures uh, more than we have had. Uh, in the past and a strengthening of a lot of those um, systems. Um, so that I think is a broad, uh, non, there's not a consensus, but there's a there's maybe a majority view in that. But in everything else, it's sort of highly contested and the extent uh, to which it goes, does it go further? And my own view is that it needs to be pretty limited and focused, but you do see this on the education sphere, for instance, uh, with the, the questions about uh, foreign students, particularly Chinese students, and Australia and the United States on exchanges. I mean, anyone who's tried to work with Chinese institutions in the last two or three years has seen real problems from their side in terms of scholars not being able to get visas, uh, exit visas, or not being able to come over. And then on the US side, if they can get out, sometimes they've been denied a visa to get here or they've been sent back. And so there is sort of a reduction in educational and scholarly um, exchange on tourism. Uh, we see uh, see that being weaponized uh, also. And then obviously there's the economic sphere outside of finance. Uh, so on trade, investment uh, and the like, and, and the scope of, of that. That debate, I think uh, we can't really predict the outcome in either the US or China yet, because there has not been an uh, in-depth enough conversation in each country about the cost benefit analysis of interdependence across these domains. So I think we still do not know whether or not interdependence is strategically beneficial to the United States or to China or not. Uh, I've heard people argue sort of both sides of that. Um, I think we're, you know, we're a lot further along in describing the phenomenon, but is you know, technological interdependence definitely a negative for the United States? I think probably, but it's still sort of unclear and unproven, and it's even more vague in other areas. So I think the extent of the hedging and decoupling will depend on sort of figuring out um, that cost, strategic cost benefit analysis. And part of that can be done abstractly, and part of it will be just through um, experience. Um, and finally, um, one thing I mentioned in the piece that Dan uh, kindly sent around, uh, and I still um, uh, sort of think has some uh, uh, some potential is whether or not there can be actually a cooperative, partial and limited decoupling between the United States and China. And that we look at this new period of rivalry, don't have many of the concepts uh, that we need to decide on the best path forward. During the Cold War, it took 10 to 15 years to come up with some of those concepts, like second strike survivability and arms control. Interdependence. Uh, to me is, uh, and to obviously most people at the conference, is one of the defining features of this period of competition, which makes it unique from previous periods. And we need to sort of figure out those concepts. And one that I've tried to put on the table is whether or not both sides will be served better by each being autonomous in certain spheres. So ultimately, is it in America's long-term interest for China not to be dependent on SWIFT? Is it in China's long-term interest for the US not to be dependent on Chinese 5G technology. I think you can make an argument that actually strategic stability is best served by conditions under which each side is not necessarily dependent on, the, on each other. At the moment, we believe that them being dependent on us gives us leverage, and they certainly have leverage in reverse. Um, but I wonder if we should give up that leverage and we could only give it up in a coordinated uh, and, and, and tit for tat manner, which would probably take a decade or so. So what I'm envisaging is something like an arms control sort of negotiation, except for interdependence. Um, so uh, I will uh, I will leave it there, and I look forward to the uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Charlie. Thank you, Eric. Um, first, I want to apologize to everybody. I have a terrible cough that has been disrupting our network. Um, so if I should reach a choke point in this presentation, <laughs> please forgive me. Um, also, <coughs> I'm to support you. So. I just also want to thank Dan. This, this has been 
fascinating event, um, and also everybody for the extremely um, interesting remarks. And I think both they both help us think concretely about the world and, and simultaneously, very theoretically, about global structures. Um, like Mark, I was surprised at the emphasis on economics in this um, forum to the exclusion of other issue areas. The environment is the one you mentioned, but you could say population flows is another that deserves its entire own panel health. It's in another. What I've been thinking about through the day is how this really interesting work um, put forth by Abe and Henry might travel to the area in which I work, which is human rights and human security. Does it travel? The overall concept being, I think, um, how do actors use disproportionate network positionality to exercise power in their own interest, given structures of interdependence? I think you can apply that to the concept of to the human rights area in a couple of ways. And, and I think those ways help us think more deeply about um, this interdependence, but also help us think about resistance. Um, we've been thinking about weaponized interdependence as um, a form of structural power, um, and and we've been, and in, in economic, financial, and energy networks, that's it's very obvious how that's the case. We see this kind of structural weaponized interdependence networks as well. So Abe and Henry began their paper with an example of Trump pulling out of the joint comprehensive and the knock-on effects on firms and states. A similar example is Trump's pulling out of, uh, pulling back as a leader in the area of refugee. Um, closed border is also a kind of choke point. Um, the, it chokes not only the refugees, but it also chokes the um, transit states who must now deal with the border. I think, though, the choking power is, is being exercised in the human rights area at a deeper level as well, however, which is not at a structural level. Our level. I'm obviously referring to Duval and Barnett's team. I think there are, there are efforts to exercise productive power over shared meanings that can also be understood through this concept of weaponizing. Rights norms are intersubjective, so they rely on productive relations of ideation. What we know empirically is that some states, particularly powerful liberal democracies, whose putative ideology has always been at the core of the international human rights regime, are in a structurally privileged position in this web of ideas. Um, that is because, um, we, we know this to be the case empirically, because the behavior of powerful liberal democracies is generally seen to matter more by human rights actors to the promulgation of the regime norms than does the behavior of human rights actors. Um, states and human rights organizations both believe um, if dictators violate human rights, we just shame them as human rights violators. When liberal democracies do so, they are seen as much more, they're now seen as norm contestants who damage not only their own legitimacy, now you can shame them, but they're damaging the entire regime. This is perceived by human rights groups as politically different um, when the US tortures prisoners or cracks down on women in South Korea. And, um, why these groups shame the evidence that uh, groups like Human Rights Watch shame the U.S. more, shame human rights actors more. So this structural difference gives or appears to give countries like the U.S. extra power, which is often thrown around in an effort to reconstitute uh, the norms themselves to align better with their own new political interests. Um, the U.S. realizes or, or shares the belief uh, they realize that others believe that human rights norms are dependent on their intersubjective understanding. And so they try to weaponize this ideational interdependence um, to attempt to shift these norms. Um, so that's an observation, and one way we can think about how to put this into human rights. But in terms of reactions and resistance, I have three things to add. And one is powerful states are not simply doing what they can while others either suffer what they must or react and resist. Powerful states, I think, are also reacting to interdependence by seeking ways to weaponize it rather than ignore it or engage. So I think we should think of these structures um, as just expressions of or conduits of really as architectures that build and shape um, the tactic of power. And, and we should see these weaponizing efforts as 
which is one of the best indicators that those constraints are uh, this is not just power politics the way thing is to concur with Bruce I think you said these toys often don't work actually um, and just to follow up on Kelly's point in the last panel that we really need to look in purity um, the fact is that though powerful states and human rights organizations believe the behavior of liberal democracies is actually not empirically true. Um, time and again, history has shown these efforts at norm contestation actually backfire, um, not only on the superpower that engages in them, but they backfire against the superpower's goals because it strengthens the regime's norms um, by giving the other, the members who believe in the regime, a target um, and it delegitimizes them. So in the paper developed as part of this project, I would imagine exploring three illustrative cases that would showcase these three dynamics. Norm contestation by powerful liberal democracies, the reaction to ideational intervention, and resistance throughout human rights networks that has the opposite effect of instantiating important global norms. So for example, I might I would probably discuss um, Bush Jr. on torture, Obama on drones, which is on warfare, but actually the human rights community extrajudicial exploitation of civilian suspected um, terrorism, human rights violations. Um, and I could go into some of that in Q&A, but I think for the sake of brevity here, let me just use one specific example, which is Trump on refugees. So um, Trump is choking, or I should say the Trump administration, is choking not only the refugees and not only the countries who must now deal with it, Ponderance of refugee care. U.S. withdrawal as a leader from the refugee rights regime seems designed to protect, protect this kind of choking power over the very concept of refugee rights. Um, and note, Trump is not just, he's not just willfully violating refugee protection. Um, and unlike other areas like the Paris Agreement and the Arms Trade Treaty, he just withdrew, just unsigned, he's not withdrawn from the refugee. What he's doing is using his policy to articulate alternative interpretation of those norms, consistent with human interest. For example, the, this fake safe third country that is not a rule. It is actually inimical to the fundamental of the regime, but it sure sounds like it might be an actual rule. So this should be seen as an exercise of productive choking power, choking and productive choking, um, as much as structural choking met with stiff resistance. So this is not working. Um, it is not likely to work. Uh, it is, there's been resistance domestically. There's been resistance in terms of And that resistance, if not forcing Trump to comply, will undermine his efforts to magically make the rules something else. The point is that, as, as Darth Vader found out, choking power works in the short term, but it has real limits. <laughs> Powers can try these tactics. They can try a lot of bad ideas, but um, one does not simply walk into a torture known world, even if you're a superpower. You can try, and just as you can try to stop a hurricane with a weapon, um, but that doesn't mean it'll work. So the torture regime, as you as you know, survived Bush's efforts to undo, you know, change the meaning of torture. And I, I predict the refugee regime will survive Trump, though. Some refugee families may not, which is very sad. Um, but I, I have a final point. You are over 10 minutes, but that's okay. Do I have time for a final point? The final point is that um, in the area of human rights and humanitarian law, it seems to me that some of the political consequences of technological and technological and institutional interdependence really flow in the other direction. In ways I think you guys model doesn't account for, but we really need to note. Weak states have, for much of the World War II, post-World War II period, used institutional panopticon multilateral conferences behind this ideational hegemony of the superpowers to um, and they do it by shining and focusing light in the spotlight in these conferences on great power precariousness. It's very hard for great powers to be in precariousness. I don't know if you know but the, the US actually tried very hard to prevent codification of rules against targeting civilians in the 1977 Chile. Not that stance because it was too embarrassing to um, stick with it. 
in the face of a huge coalition of developing, newborn developing countries that are aligned with Russia to give them So whether we think of this, and it was, it was having that open forum that did this. So I don't know if we want to think of that as a kind of knocked point where the weak people are strong, or if it's a different kind of ideational network of power entirely. Maybe the concept of swarming is better. But it's not inconsequential. Yeah, and the other element of this is interdependence has empowered not just weak states, it has also empowered non-state actors to be significant. And there's been some things said about this here. I'll, I'll just say, when you have images of and video of human rights violations in real time disseminated a single individual in a country, media as an intermediary or the state, this reshapes the network structure meaning in ways that's not always helpful to states. I'm not saying it can't also be exploited by states. Uh, I don't want to sound unduly optimistic. And also, the ability of individuals to leverage social media and amplify their message can be as easily used by states as human rights activists. But my point is that interdependence also empowers individuals by creating pathways to eradicate choke points by using a reverse panopticon effect. This is what WikiLeaks Anonymous and, and other groups do, and why the sovereign state system finds them so to, to sum up, I really am done here. <laughs> we can extrapolate this concept well beyond the issue area of finance or economics, arenas that involve ideas as well as information flows, and productive as well as structural power. We need to think about resistance, not only about resistance against weaponizers, weaponizing itself as a reaction against the concrete vagaries of it. <clears throat> an uh, and it's an interdependence the powerful can't afford to lose. Um, we must think about ways in which this panopticon effect can be used against the powerful. I love at this conference, sorry, now I really am out of time. I love that so many of you have done that at this conference. I think that's the world we live in, and we can't unscramble that egg. Charlie, and you've really opened the door to a whole new set of questions, which I think will be very interesting to discuss. Uh, Anastasia. Thank you very much. First, thank you for the invitation. And uh, we worked previously on sanctions, and I'm happy to be uh, able to discuss on a scale, which is what I see in this conference, which I see starting with sanctions in Russia, that the issue is much more beyond sanctions, but beyond the sanctions of Putin uh, and formal and knowledge sources. Thinking right, uh, about my topic that I wanted to cover about weaponized interdependence, the first question that well, we <coughs> can uh, try to discuss, speaking about outcomes, which word uh, here matters more, weaponized or interdependence? Because this is one of the dividing lines in, uh, in some Russian domestic debates. So, what we should focus on. Uh, and, and as a result, different answer causes different and sometimes contradictory policies. Let's raise some Russian debate later on, but now some <coughs> comments on global outcomes. First, a clear challenge that we can see here is the challenge for economic growth. Because the uh, uh, expenses of hedging of this competition, no matter are you weaponizing power and power that resists, the power that tries to avoid this resist, increase. These expenses, they will absorb some drivers for both, at least as we knew it within liberal globalization. And uh, I think that it can be a really a rising topic, especially if we expect some new global economic crisis. And uh, well, uh, there are a set of signals that it's not a question of some foggy future. So in some pretty visible period of time, it will matter more. And it will matter more for recovery after this. Because both in 1990 and 2008, the whole recovery process was stimulated based on the rising growth of Asia, and particularly of China. Not on weaponization of this dependence, but that on increasing this dependence and that kind of increasing recovery. So, if we see, observe a continuing fragmentation of key international systems that we discussed today in many forms, in both uh, finance and trade and cyber and data and logistics, the question of ideas that it opens like the new door. Uh, we will elaborate uh, either we see the bigger fragmentation or with some period of time we'll be able to elaborate some opportunities for some kind 
of compatibility. Of course, it goes against the whole logic of urbanization, but at least in some areas, I see that in some periods of time, we'll find some signals. Uh, probably first, we'll go through very intensifying fragmentation and then through some kind of reglobalization. Not deglobalization, but some reglobalization based on new norms. And the clear opportunity that comes from this weapon ascender concept, let's call it glory, uh, it's uh, opportunity to outsource the choice of particular networks and ecosystems for third countries, for uh, non-state actors. Uh, a third option, uh, so when country or non-state actor has to choose between US network or China associated network, uh, seems like pretty for the short term and uh, this is um, the strategy that great but not superpowers can provide on their own or in cooperation with the others some we recently had a very interesting conference uh, in russia with many representatives of south asian countries southeast asian countries and they repeated several times this uh, allusion about uh, non-alignment movement, but non-alignment movement in cyber, finance, or space, or just uh, the idea of trust and broker, like I can Of course, the, the scope of these opportunities is pretty limited compared to big debate on US and uh, Chinese rather. There is the room for that kind of search for strategies. And, uh, maybe in so longer period, the question of compatibility of these hubs and networks, not compatibility of hub uh, by China or driving by the US, but compatibility of some small, maybe not so perfect network collaborated in Europe, Africa, or in Latin America, compatible with Chinese network or with American network. Um, and probably who will be first, so America or China, providing this opportunity to Hey guys, okay, Europeans or Asian countries, you're welcome to develop your own network and we'll be ready to share at least some elements of network, some hubs to make it compatible. It will provide them a pretty high leverage. And uh, also there is an issue that we didn't say, if I'm not mistaken, but it seems to me that it can be the point as well, that uh, being able to design your own network and hubs become not just a question of either national security or economic uh, but the question of prestige and status. Mm -hmm. What we have, regard, what we see on sanctions, it's partial example, but when Saudi Arabia sanctions Canada or imposes sanctions over Qatar, that's a lot about great power or regional power status. Um, regarding data or network, I think the demand will be even higher. For now, well, okay, I move to implications for Russia. To my opinion, it's an example that can be interesting for several reasons. First, Russia faces economic cars and measures. Second, it issues its own, sometimes a different form. The, the, the case is when it re just replicates American or European model of sanctions, like calling it counter sanctions. Uh, well, it's pretty boring case study, to my opinion. But when it issues its own coercive measures on uh, neighboring countries and also in space, this is uh, much more interesting. And at the same time, Russia has some capacities to challenge both China and the US in some particular areas, but has not enough capacities for purely symmetric competition. So it puts it on a bit special status that can be comparable to Indian status or some European status. And that's uh, interesting. To provide a short review on how Russia made its choices on reaction, resistance, adaptation strategies. And, uh, but starting from, not from 2014, but some, like about five years prior to that. So like the history period, it was more about evaluation of risks. It uh, coincided with rising, uh, with high, uh, with the global financial crisis and afterwards with rising pressure on Iran that Russia supported on that time. Uh, and uh, the peak, peak was reached uh, when the peak on uh, Iranian sanctions before GCPOA was on table. So from 2009 to 2014. The first idea is about pivot policy, so some rebalancing of Russian very strong uh, relations or dependence on 
Okay, guys, let's think about Asia and uh, worked a lot on uh, that uh, direction. And sometimes we really had to talk in a way that we have a huge market, the booming market with the longest order, and uh, there was no real temptation to power this up. A direction that I think is underrated was food security program because the level of dependence um, of imports of food in Russia in like 2009 to 2010 was uh, well it was very hard to explain besides the factor so it was there was no enough attention to it before uh, then that was the period when low debt strategy started but it wasn't so intense it was just some kind of idea in 2013-14 we started uh, the offshoreization initiatives they weren't successful but at least formally they started before things. Then 2014 to 2017, I would call like uh, a period of accepting the reality that um, the content, uh, content has changed and uh, the program of intense import substitution started, uh, the idea of international diversification, and in general it was a period of intense learning. How would we have to develop in general, how it has to function under sanctions and then broader under this open rivalry. 2007 till the present time, I would say that we're in a bit in an um, unclear situation. We have uh, what we see if we study Russian domestic economic policy, social policy. See, we see the clear um, question which chosen is in priority survival strategy or development strategy? If we speak about that kind of business idea. So if we speak about survival strategy, right now we can say that it's more or less okay. Yes, Russia made its own uh, swift. No matter in the world is interested in using it now instead of swift. But in the worst case scenario, there is some tool that can soften uh, the consequences. There are some um, instruments elaborated to pay without direct US control of the swift currency swaps. Some of them works pretty well. Some of them just are are not functional, but at least the direction is pretty clear. So we, uh, Russia needs more opportunities to pay, not in dollars. And the dollarization is, uh, as today, it's really kind of, it's not just an idea, it's one of national uh, Import substitution now uh, shifts a bit from the idea that we have to be able to produce everything on our own, towards some more balanced idea that to be able to at least um, find some proper partners to produce something that is really important. Uh, and uh, priority of law or is now zero foreign debt is clear. Uh, but the problem is that survival strategy is good for um, doomsday. So for example, Russian investment in gold, that's a clear answer that uh, the idea of the dollarization is here. So, Russian government considers that dollar is not the perfect option for payments. But there is no clear answer what is the perfect upper, uh, substitution for savings. Neither RMB nor Euro aren't considered as that kind of uh, solutions. So, for doomsday situation, we can say the strategy is more or less clear. But for development strategy, the situation is not so obvious at all because what development strategy would include? flexibility to be able to to a different uh, business culture and business more diversification uh, it's more openness of free trade agreements multiplying networks and it's all uh, accepted on political level but uh, restriction for this strategy comes much more not from interdependence that for survival from domestic business culture, domestic relations between state, business, and in fact, the answer on how this strategy can uh, elaborate, they're much more domestic and international. Okay, so long-term <laughs> challenges that are pretty uh, open question. Um, the question is which challenge will be considered as the most important, stagnation challenge or weaponized challenge? And now I can say that there is some open solution. Uh, what is really important to do is to evaluate the acceptable degree of vulnerability. We talked a lot about vulnerability today, but there is no some clear formula at least um, 
most of the countries how to find what is an acceptable degree of vulnerability. The idea of non vulnerability is so sufficient. Uh, just to finish, I wanted to skip this part. Um, the third country option that is very important part of Russian strategy for um, dealing with not China and the US, but is uh, like second tier country, second tier powers. And uh, I would call that this demand for third option is more like kind of boutique hotel trend that uh, is in good competition, challenges globally known hotel chains. So in boot if you have boutique chain, some boutique hotels, you can't get as much money if you rule uh, some chain. But the demand for that kind of option is pretty clear. And to conclude here, in uh, general, what we see is that the system becomes more dynamic, more mosaic, and less coherent. And it, it comes that it's easier to survive. Because even now we have more options to survive, like for example, Iran in 2013. But it's more expensive to conquer. So I will stop here and then we can explore this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Let me start off by saying thank you to Dan for inviting me to your superb initiative. I'm sorry that I haven't been able to join you all in person, but with Rx and the team's efficient organization, I have been listening in on much of the stimulating discussion over yesterday and today. So I'm going to be focusing on the question, are there any weapons of the week that the rest can use in a world of weaponized interdependence. And by the rest, I mean those states that are not usually located in the hubs of the networks, and which seem to be at the receiving end of asymmetric interdependence that Henry and Abe's paper identified. So let me start off by flagging up two insights from Henry and Abe's paper, which are quite important for my argument. So first, the concept of weaponized interdependence reminds us about the linkages between political economy and security, something that Stacy also emphasized in her comments yesterday. Now, these linkages admittedly are not new per se. The use of economic means to secure political ends has a long history. But much of the post-war economic system was indeed premised on assumptions of the virtue dependence. Yes, we had the Cold War, but the Soviet bloc was many institutions like the GATT, like the World Bank, like the IMF. Within the system, increased economic integration was supposed to contribute to peace. The European project was also guided by this same logic. At the end of the Cold War, this assumption of convergence persisted that the shared and interdependent pursuit of wealth and welfare would produce peace. The international rules that we've built, for instance, in the case of the World Trade Organization, reflect these assumptions. These rules are really not built for a world where countries, the results, economic liberalization for geostrategic gain. Now, this limitation of international organizations has huge implications for smaller countries, developing countries, which have relied on multilateralism to protect themselves against the excesses of power. The second important contribution of Henry and Abe's paper is to identify the mechanisms underpinning weaponized interdependence. And if they are right, if, as Dan put it yesterday, there are indeed network externalities that are so great that you end up with natural monopolies, then this potentially puts countries not on the hubs in a precarious position. Because what this logic does is that it reduces their BATNAP, 
their best alternative to negotiated agreement? If so, then there is all the more reason to explore what countries of the global south can do, resist or insulate themselves. So what can you do if you're not on a hub that is accumulating greater power? And I would suggest that there are at least five strategies available which probably matter more at different points of time. So the first strategy, and that is lie low and make some limited gains, almost by default. Recent studies show that the US-China trade war has produced a redirection of trade towards some Asian countries. For example, Bangladesh in the case of textiles, Vietnam in the case of electronics. So oh, you get an overall decline in growth, but the argument here is the shrinking pie can be redistributed to the relative benefit of smaller players. But this is still a passive strategy rather than a proactive one. So the second strategy, and the second strategy has something to do with nuisance value through choke points. There are instances in which state and non-state actors may be able to exploit choke points. The attack on the Saudi oil facility, Iran or Houthi, was another example of the disruption that smaller players can cause to larger players. Turkey, very recently, as of yesterday, threatened to flood Europe with 3.6 million refugees for the EU's criticism of its attacks on northern Syria point that Charlie was also referring to about migration, human rights, and people, and how this, how this factor enters in the story of weaponized interdependence. Third, hedging. And we've heard, that we've heard interesting ideas on this earlier, also from Tom. And several ASEAN countries, for instance, have pointed out that they are being courted by multiple actors as never before. And this has improved their BATNA. Japan has interestingly created its position as part of the Quad Security Dialogue, while also extending conditional support to BRI, to the Belgian Road Initiative. Hedging is a plausible course of action for smaller players in the short run, but probably not a sustainable one in the medium run, especially if confrontation among the major powers increases and decoupling does indeed occur between the hubs. Fourth strategy, form coalitions. External balancing has long been a strategy employed. <coughs> Relatively explicit attempts such as the Quad are, is one set of examples on how countries are trying to deal with the BRI. Weaker, we're also seeing weaker alignments, for example, between India and Japan. But coalitions among members of the Global South, or even with some middle powers, might not be far-reaching enough. Having another key actor on board that occupies a hub in a network may be a game-changer. The EU could potentially play such a role. This would really depend on the reform of its own domestic institutions and also a rethink on and a reassertion of the that it stands for. A fifth strategy, and this has something to do with narratives. So Henry and Abe take into account the role of domestic institutions and norms, which influence the extent to which and the ways in which already powerful actors use networks to weaponize interdependence. Recent studies in economics have highlighted the role of narratives as an important intermediary variable that interconnects with networks and norms. We saw China develop a narrative about its own role as the guardian of globalization. In the last year, several players from the global south and also the US have developed counter narratives that portray the BRI and other Chinese economic endeavors in a negative light, for example, through narratives about debt diplomacy or neocolonialism, 
So the five strategy strategies that I've just identified show the potential for the rest. But to conclude, I just want to raise two further points. First, that this agency also bears relevance for the powerful actors that have jurisdiction over the hubs. So the pre for example, the presence of allies from the world regions may be important both for the exercise of panopticon effects and also to deter damage caused by the potential capture of choke points from rivals. Narratives that support particular variants of weaponized interdependence would have a greater chance of going viral with the support of network nodes also from the global south. So, and how these interactions play out in my view, would be an important um, consideration towards building that dynamic model that Abe spoke about in his presentation yesterday. Yesterday, That's one. And then the second point that I want to raise is right now I focus on reaction and resistance from the global south. Of course, you have asymmetric interdependence within the global south too where you might also expect cases of weaponized interdependence or at the very least economic statecraft. And this, in my view, would be another way, another exciting way to develop the project further. And I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amrita. Uh, so I think uh, we all understand that in many ways this conference is uh, the continuation or even the beginning of the conversation on weaponized independence rather than the end. And this panel hopefully has opened a number of new avenues that we can pursue in this discussion. Now, before I open it up, I want to pick up on something that uh, Anastasia said about uh, acceptable levels of vulnerability. We talked in the last panel about um, perceptions of weaponized interdependence as opposed to uh, real world use of uh, state coercion through these networks. And I wonder uh, how is it that states can assess what is an acceptable level of vulnerability uh, and uh, what what can they do uh, in order to uh, make sure that they are at that level? That's a very hard question and I have no clear answer how to do that, but I think that here we see different tracks and how to even get closer to this question. First, to, and also can differ depending on the process of decision making. So we studied, for example, authoritarian regimes and then decided to do how this process of vulnerability comes. Uh, second, I think it's also very interesting to see in dynamics because when something appears and we categorize it as a source of uh, potential threat, and then years come and we see that it's not as even if it's be used as a weapon and it's not used for years uh we see that maybe it's not just because our opponent is so wise and waiting till the bad moment but just because we want to use it and it's also the question we had a very interesting talk today about Gazprom and is it a weapon or it's not uh so in general i think that probably more theoretical the couple against Paul and Murray Buzan with his ideas of securitization can be very good here whether it's real problem or it's just our perception of it. Uh, the last but not the least, I think it's the cost of uh, this uh, vulnerability. So if we see that it's not, uh, we, we want, uh, we will want, states will want to build some balance between uh, vulnerability and uh, some budget limitations. The most uh, urgent argument in how to cut your ambitions out about being willing to be not uh, vulnerable. So, good to be vulnerable, but it's not so good to be extremely prepared. Okay. Would anyone else like to answer before I turn it over to the audience for Q&A? Questions? Yeah, I have a um, Tom, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Tom. So my question is to you. Um, I, I'm intrigued by your notion of you know, perhaps can, let's say, the U.S. and China agree to 
what I would, I guess I would call a velvet decoupling, if, if that's, you know, what, how you'd want to phrase it, um, with the idea that that would somehow reduce anxiety and thereby, you know, be uh, potentially stabilizing. I have two counter reactions, and I just want to get your take on this. One is, is that, you know, I'm old enough to remember what the Cold War was like, and the Cold War was anxious, but nonetheless, there was strategic stability precisely because there was the recognition that if you really went after, you know, and, and you know, launched an attack, whether, you know, through nuclear weapons, you were creating mutually assured destruction. So wouldn't it also be possible that you'd actually want to create a similar dynamic um, economically that this, you know, the sort of financial balance of terror should have the same sort of security effects? Now, maybe one of the problems here is that everyone forgets that we were actually pretty anxious about this during the Cold War. But nonetheless, there was strategic stability there. So isn't that one way you can go? Or... The other way you can go is, you know, based on some of what we've talked about here, it turns out that weaponized interdependence is real, but also perhaps not completely, you know, as as overpowering in many cases as people have been, you know, as perhaps we might think. And so that maybe the other thing that needs to happen is that both sides need to, you know, in that basically what we need to do is ride out the anxiety that eventually both sides will realize their great powers, in fact, efforts to try to do this towards each other probably will not amount to much. And therefore, once that recognition happens, that also reduces um, tensions. Yeah, no, great, um, great question. Uh, I mean, I guess my first reaction is, what do you say? I mean, that that may be right, right? I mean, I think what we haven't really, what we're only beginning to do, and your conference is a is a is an important part of that as was henry and abe's article is to begin to try to figure out the strategic implications of interdependence under conditions of rivalry right so my sort of proposal is that's just one you know possibility it may be that that doesn't really work and actually you know some assured deterrence is 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 easier uh, to to or better uh, to to get there i, I think what we will be doing for much of the next five, 10 years is through a mixture of, you know, theoretical conceptual work and sort of a lived experience, including crises, is we will hopefully end up at a point where it's sort of clear what an equilibrium might look like and how we will get there. So um, I think that all of that is sort of up for grabs. Just on your two, um, on your two um, points, um, on the mutually assured destruction, um, you know, it took a long time to get to that um, because, of, you know, it took a long time to to develop those concepts that underpinned um, it. Um, but I think that the assurance of, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that nuclear weapons were so obviously destructive it clearly made it less likely that they would be used. These tools, um, the destruction is much less obvious and uh, much less absolute. Um, so I think the threshold for use is a lot lower, and in many ways they are being used now, as Henry and Abe are showing. So, um, so I don't really think, to me, that mutually assured destruction would work. And Dan, with just one word, could you remind me of the second question as well? Question. In some ways, it's the opposite suggestion that maybe it turns out weaponized interdependence isn't quite all it's cracked up to be, and that winds up reducing anxiety. Right. Right. Um, Perhaps, but but I guess I, I I don't I don't think we're we're going to end up there. I mean, the way I sort of look at it is that countries right now are trying to unilaterally uh, disengage and close off, and their rivals are are come up with ways to exploit their vulnerabilities. You know, so they're doing that unilaterally, and that if we don't try to coordinate this in some way, uh, I think the greater risk is that it it, it moves beyond what we would want, right? So um, a limited decoupling becomes a much more expansive decoupling. And I, I guess as evidence, I would just offer what we've seen over the last two and a half years. This has already spiraled on the trade side, you know, with Trump. Uh, it won't be, um, you know, experts and academics and others who will sort of set the terms of this once the Pandora's box is open, unless there's a framework, it could easily you know, just there could be path dependencies that just push it in that direction. And I think that countries will be willing to pay an economic price um, for um, 
for that. And, and as I mentioned, some of the domestic forces are, are reinforcing that. So um, I hope you're right, but I, I, I worry that, that it probably is not uh, where we're headed. much for very interesting remarks. I have two questions. Um, can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Uh, so my first question is to uh, uh, Dr. Wright. Um, I'm interested in your suggestion about um, potential arm con control field. Um, and of course, there will be some areas in which to which it, it can apply more and to which it can apply it a little bit less. If you could um, elaborate a little bit more when you suggested something like this, which area of interdependence um, could this uh, policy implication uh, work? Question is uh, to everybody, a potential of the author's um, article. Um, I know we discussed yesterday and today that there are a lot of great areas that um, constitute this interdependence and weaponized, but I was still wanted to Kind of know where which are the clear areas when it's just interdependence cases of interdependence compared to the cases of weaponizing. Um, are those um, scope conditions that you outlined in the article the club and having domestic institutions? Of the presenters today suggested that be enough. Um, so having you know this day and a half of discussions, would you kind of adjust a little bit? Uh, maybe some scopes conditions. Have you, you know, I, I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts, but I would be interested in having clear <coughs> cuts, whereas just interdependence that we see and whereas they, it's becoming weaponized. So, Tom, would you like to start? Yeah, I can start. Um, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think it should, you know, will apply differently across different areas. I think for the US, the main issue is the tech side. I think for China, it's finance, um, and you know, I think it's it, it will be hard to coordinate those because they're d different. Um, so this would take a very long period of time. I think any um, discussion would also get wrapped up in the domestic issues too. And there, I think the question is, what is existentially challenging for the U.S. economic model? What does the U.S. need China to do, and what can the U.S. basically tolerate? with sort of modest measures of hedging or pushback, you know, more coordination with um, Europe or the like. I mean, my own view, which is not everyone's view, I mean, someone like Derek Scissors at AEI is a much more expansive definition of this, but my inclination would be to try to limit it as much as possible. So to have a very sort of focused, very specific uh, sort of areas, but I think they would largely be located in those two in, in tech and in finance. Henry, Abe? I'm going to say something about this in the concluding comments because we uh, already had a very similar question in the last session as well. So I, I think there are a couple of things I would say. First of all, I think that I really think that what Tom said is absolutely right, which is to say that there is a, you know, there are two ways in which you can think about this. One, you can think about this as being a broad set of of roughly related topics where you have uh, the security realm and the economic realm intersecting in a variety of new ways and you're sort of frankly making international political economy interesting again because it is now political again. You know, we've had a, a couple of decades where IPD has been really just this kind of, uh, I think, extremely bland set of arguments about how everything is getting more open because of economic efficiency and trade and whatever, and isn't it awesome? And now it's getting political again, which is pretty awful for the world, uh, but it is really, really fun and interesting for international relations scholars. Uh, but this is a broad set of related topics, a broad set of related questions, some of which are weaponized interdependence, some of which are cognate kinds of mechanisms to weaponize interdependence, maybe involving other kinds of network effects, and some of which are quite different, again, altogether, but nonetheless interesting. So I think we, we want to be very, you know, we want to be reasonably careful in making sure, and this is something which uh, I think Abe and I are both, we're both a bit worried about and we're a bit resigned to, which is that this concept seems to be just 
taking off as a kind of a catchphrase, and that means that we are no longer going to be fully in control of it anymore. It's going to become a catchphrase. You see it being used on the on Twitter and other places for a variety of different things, some of which are what we think of as weaponized interdependence, some of which uh, emphatically are not. Uh, there's only so much we can do about that in the broader discourse, but we can and we should, as Tom says, be as careful as we can as social scientists in trying to pick this apart and trying to understand it. So I would say that the, uh, you know, the, the scope conditions for what weaponized interdependence is, how you can tell when it's happening is, first of all, you've got something which is a clearly identifiable asymmetric network. Secondly, you have got a, a state which is in some way in control of uh, one of the core nodes of that network. And third, you have clear and intentional act action by that state actor in order to try and leverage the uh, control of the node uh, for the kinds of purposes that we identify. So I think those are the three things. We are together. We can say that this is plausibly weaponized interdependence. And so here, for example, you know, so to take an example, you know, if you look at the um, uh, Japan and South Korea situation, where Japan you know, plausibly is weaponized interdependence. There is a there is a choke point in supply chains. There is a a key good or a small set of key goods that Japan is uniquely capable of supplying that have cons uh, that is very consequential to the South Korean economy. Japan has taken actions which I don't think it is publicly announced or intended to put pressure on South Korea, but everybody uh, knows that this is what is happening. And this is being used specifically as a form of leverage vis-a-vis -vis South Korea, not simply involving a kind of state-to-state -state, uh, interdependence, but the fact that global supply chains are such there isn't, there aren't any other plausible uh, places that uh, South Korea can readily find. I think that's, that to me is a reasonable example of what weaponized interdependence looks like. And the final thing, obviously, and this is something that I thought was very useful in the previous panel, is that we, uh, is that we see is that there, there, it's very, very easy uh, to think of stuff as being weaponized interdependence and as being intentional when it isn't necessarily so. You know, so we're all subject to the fundamental attribution error. And this is, I think, a real problem. You know, so when we're thinking about the Gazprom thing is that there are lots of ways in which you, know, you, you might think about some of what a Gazprom is doing as being uh, looking to weaponize this, that, and the other, and it may be that in some cases it is, but also Gazprom very clearly is a commercial actor and has, you know, sort of, as well as being a, a massive you know, scheme for diverting money, as was discussed, associates. And, as, and, and you know, similarly, we can, um, you know, when we think about Belt and Road, uh, it could be that this is a long-term weaponized interdependence uh, play, uh, but the jury is out, and there could be many, many other plausible effects, some of which are strategic in, in uh, intent, some of which are just about uh, the Chinese domestic economy, which could be going into it as well or instead of weaponized interdependence. So we just want to make sure that, you know, that, that we don't have too much of what uh, the comparative uh, political scientist Giovanni Sartori called conceptual stretching. Uh, that's a perpetual risk and temptation, and we want to. I think. I think that the narrow weaponized interdependence focus is uh, it's what we want to think about as political scientists, while recognizing that uh, more broadly in the public debate, it is probably going to become a huge, useful catchphrase for people who want to talk about a broader and more diffuse set of questions. Thank you. So there were two uh, hands up, Bruce. Yeah, um, so it's mostly a question from Rita and, and, and Charlie, but I'm thinking that you know, we started with the conception of power, right? That's where we started this, and the notion of what weaponized interdependence does for the utility of power. And we mostly see we're thinking about the big powers, you know, those well endowed powers, US, China, Russia. Um, and I think some of the discussion on the Global South is kind of flipping it, and I think we talked about this in the other panels too. Now, what's the power of those that are less powerful in terms of classical measures of power, right? So one of the questions here, I think the point, one of the points that I took from your comments, Amrita, was the ability of the global south, let's call it the weaker, then the bigger powers from achieving their objectives, right? Sort of my point about target state defense. The question is, um, can this, the smaller powers use weaponized interdependence in their own way, not just to block the major powers, but to achieve their own objectives, right? 
and the spin-off of that, Charlie, is thinking about what you're the emphasis you're putting on, you know, human rights and, and, and these variety of other normative areas. Henry's notion of is there a way of applying weaponized independence for whoever the advocates are, whether it's you know certain governments or NGOs, to use weaponized independence to achieve their objectives better in these areas, or does that take us to another chain of power without the conceptual stretching? Thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, the, the way I understood Henry and Abe's paper, um, what, and if they're right in terms of uh, how these asymmetric networks are working and that they're going to get more and more asymmetric, then for, for the Global South, for the regions to be able to use this mechanism is going to get harder and harder. Right. But I think this is an empirical question on which we need more work. We need to see what are the issue areas in which there is dominance of these types of networks from um, uh, from the middle powers. Um, having said that, I would say that we are we do see this in operation within the global south. Right. So we saw this, for example, in the case of Pakistan closing off airspace. In the case of in India, and it was able to do this because it's on a it's on a major aviation route, and and it caused quite a lot of um, uh, damage costs not only to Indian Airlines but other airlines as well. So we're seeing this asymmetric interdependence, possibly weaponized interdependence coming in in south uh, south relations. It's an empirical question to which I don't have an answer, but it's a good question. And some of us at our institute are pursuing this. Uh, may I just, while I have the floor, may I just come in with a, a question, Arik? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that's been missing a little bit in my eyes from this discussion is the role of institutions, right? And Pasha, I think, said something early in one of, in the earlier panel when he talked about how the US and uh, Russia tried to come up with a set of rules, but it was difficult because uh, there is, we have to exchange information that we don't want to exchange. And so all you get is empty political declarations. But in terms of the existing institutions that we have, is there anything that we can do to reform them, to change them? And I would be very curious, uh, especially for, um, uh, Abe and Henry's comment on this and also Tom's and then the other the other sort of maybe there is a divergence I'm not sure but something that Abe said yesterday was uh, he doesn't really see decou decoupling ha happening what he sees more is like a divorce right a divorce and he gave Brexit as an example and I wasn't so sure I wasn't so sure why you would feel this even cautious optimism because if your mechanism works and you're going to get these greater and greater asymmetries, then you should be getting more decoupling. So I'd be curious about how you saw that play out. Thanks. Tom, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, on the institutions, it's a um, question I'm afraid I don't have a, a, a good answer um, to it. I think, I think what Abe and Henry sort of describe is a lot of the action is outside of these formal institutions, right? In some ways, the formal institutions, because they're pretty old, um, because they're uh, relatively inert, um, haven't sort of allowed some of these dynamics to, to emerge. And so I think that what we talk about reform of financial institutions or other types of institutions, um, and we don't really get the type of reform we need, that's sort of a separate topic, I, I think, I might be wrong about this, uh, but I think it's sort of a separate topic to these other areas that in some ways have been much more dynamic. And, and Henry mentioned sort of the IPE literature. I think it, it is sort of interesting that, you know, IPE did focus on these sort of bricks and mortar institutions because they were there and they were measurable. Um, but that actually wasn't where most of these um, dynamics were. Um, my own sort of bottom line is that I think as long as rivalry, particularly between the US and China continues, it will um, dramatically affect interdependence. I, I don't think we know how um, exactly, but I think as long as that continues, uh, it will 
will affect change and I think it, you know it will it will go in directions that we don't expect because leaders will make choices that aren't that are rational in terms of how they look at things but aren't necessarily rational in terms of how we looked at things 10 15 20 years ago Holly, did you want to say something? Yes, um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly where to start, but I think I'll start with Ruth, which is to just say thank you. That was a really rich that I can't really answer very well because I need to chew on it a little. Um, but I will say that um, the question, as I recall, it was could we act as also this kind of. Um, and I guess I would say that to even tackle that question, Kind of comes back to this point about who is the weak actor. Henry is saying, you know, we're really adopt your definition. This is a very state centric model. The state has to be. I'm not necessarily alarmed, but but is is the weak actor that I'm looking at a weak state? And if so, or or a non-state actor. If it's a weak state, is it a weak state that wants to? Um, test human rights law the way the U.S. does, or is it a weak state that wants to build stronger human rights laws to bind two totally different things? A non-state actor, a non-state actor like ISIS, that is invested in challenging the entire foundation of the law, but also exploiting it to shock people and terrorize people. Um, or are we talking about a non-state actor like anti drug Adopted a hedging strategy. Actually, it's very interesting. And Rita, that was a really useful typology you gave. I'm so thankful. Um, they've adopted a hedging strategy with respect to transnational anti-drone activists because they don't like the, the <coughs> narratives they're using. So I think it's very complicated. Um, but I guess I would say um, that I don't know if I like LDO is unnecessarily limiting to keep this concept based. Um, only in situations where the worst load, I think that it might be useful to stretch it in some different ways. I will say that the other element that you mentioned, which is the intent to leverage control of that, be unhelpfully broad as opposed to narrow, in the sense that it is very hard and pure to determine the um, Just ask any lawyer who's tried to like. There's been a lot of really great questions raised about how we know whether we're seeing and what's the empirical basis for differentiating it from the other. Just various structures of power in the No good answer, but some open. Let's collect the last few questions. So, this is a hot pursuit question on, on the conversation that. Charlie was just engaged in because my question for you had been: um, you mentioned that uh, that the week use uh, the panopticon of international conferences, for example, as a way to shine light on great power or violations, misbehavior for their own ends. Um, and and I wonder if that speaks to this conversation you're having with Henry about the can we reconceptualize nodes to have, <laughs> okay, this is conceptual stretching, but it's not obvious to me from the structure of this argument why these are not networks of states that you're studying. They're networks mostly of firms. So why the state has to be the hub or the node is looks kind of arbitrary to me, both analytically and substantively. So, um, so I'm kind of on board with Charlie here for a whole lot of reasons. But then you need a more clear articulation of so what constitutes a node in a network that is not a network of just states. So are international conferences node or are convening points a node? I mean, how, how one would even think about what nodes are in a multi-type actor network, which I think are the networks that Abe and Henry are talking about. Um, there's some um, thought. I'll just leave it there. And Dan, you had a question? 
Yeah, half comment, half question. I'm struck uh, by the sort of overlap between Amrita's points and Charlie's points, particularly the sort of discussion of norms and narratives. Um, that I, I think, Charlie, you bring up an excellent point, which is to say that it's possible you could try to, you, you know, if you're trying to guard against weaponized interdependence, creating a norm against it is obviously one way to do it. And that sort of ties into Amrita's point about narratives. But, and as you point out, and this is important, norms, you know, a norm can be violated and then be strengthened. Um, and so just out of curiosity, just to have some fun with this, assume for the moment that a lot of what we're seeing now, I mean, weaponized interdependence existed pre-Trump. It would be safe to say that Trump has taken this and put it on steroids and then put steroids on top of the steroids. So if, let's say, Trump loses in 2020 and, you know, the newly elected leader, you know, in some ways is in no small part elected by a repudiation of what Trump has done. And I admit this is probably wish casting on my part. Do you think this phenomenon you know, will perhaps not be quite as visible precisely because the lesson will be, well, yes, states went there, but this was a bad ending in the end. And so we will try to like, you know, prevent. in other words, can you see the sort of creation of these kinds of norms and narratives that would actually reduce the utility of this? And one more question, I think. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if, if there's time, uh, sort of resistance to the resistance or resistance to the disengagement from within the state. Uh, I, uh, this summer I was uh, studying in Armenia um, and I saw that, uh, so Russian gas exporters are resisting de-dollarization because they uh, actually still get more rubles when, uh, from a, a given conversion. So they're, even though um, their trading partners are ambivalent, they're the ones that are actually pushing back against Putin. And similarly, um, uh, Russian Central Bank is not willing to give out loans in rubles or um, encourage more ruble denominated futures, um, which is needed even within the Eurasian Economic Union to aid the sort of push for de-dollarization. So if I could get your perspective on sort of the bottlenecks of that. Okay, and final comment question. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, I just, I, I think for us and our argument, two features, one is uh, reconceiving of the structure that networks generate and so that you know it's the idea that they're not always flat that they can be centralized and then the second part of our argument is what are the strategies that states then have given that structure so there's these two different components so you could easily think about given this other structure where it's a more centralized structure what other what are the strategies of other actors uh, weak states or non-state actors i think the article is very focused on the choke point and the panopticon is that the strategies that states pursue, but I just think that that might open it up for other people to dive in by thinking about okay, <coughs> there's two there's two different planes. The one is what is the network typology, and then what are the strategies that actors pursue given that network typology. We in our article are focused on the state strategies, but you could imagine other. Okay, so with about five minutes remaining, uh, who would like to start? Charlie first. I can just very quickly respond to Dan. One thing I'll say is I don't think you need a new norm against trying to contest human rights norms. You just need it not to work. That's, I'm sorry, that's punished, what I meant, yeah. And that itself reaffirms the norms. And you need as many other actors as possible to reaffirm that the counter narrative needs to be, no, this is actually what human rights law says. Of course, human rights law is always contested um, at the margins. Um, but big violations or big Stations back again. Yes, it would be great if um, he if he is removed from office. If there is a very visible effort by the human rights community to indicate that that is partly because he was a human rights violator, maybe we'll see that. Maybe we won't because there are other. That's really good. Well, I can be very quick. Uh, first, exchange, despite all the dollarization for policy, exchange rate uh, risk premium is still there, and banks are stupid, and uh, gas companies are stupid. They still consider this issue. And second, it, it comes to my point about survival strategy and development strategy. For survival strategy, dollarization is clear. Development strategy, you have a bunch of problems or gold or whatever. 
if there is a decision, to, okay, we decide to invest this money to, or allocate this money to some private companies, no matter even who owes it, uh, in a way to stimulate economic growth this way, is it good or bad? It's another question. That is, but there is no other kind of decision. So we have money, we have the dollarization, but we have no decision on how to allocate. Sure. Um, I'll take Dan's um, question. Um, I, 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 Charlie said in terms of the human rights area, I, I agree, but on other areas of weaponized interdependence, I think actually if Trump is replaced by Elizabeth Warren, say I don't think you would see any sort of norm against weaponized interdependence. I think you may actually um, see an acceleration of it in certain areas for a couple of reasons. One, she has a quite a strong view on the nature of the global economy and, and a desire to change it. And I think she would use the leverage available to her to do that. Secondly, in terms of US-China relations, her, she and her team have been pretty clear that they want to de-emphasize hard power military competition. I think they may not succeed in doing that, but that's sort of their intent. So they're naturally drawn toward economic power and, and not just sanctions power. So I think their first port of call will really be the non-kinetic aspects of power, which is right in this weaponized interdependent space. I don't think they would frame it in that way that they're going to try to use weaponized interdependence, but I think that will be sort of the net effect just of their worldview, presuming that the world continues to be a pretty competitive place. And I'm reading. Thank you. Uh, Great question, Dan. Um, I would, I, I would, I, I'm sort of a, a really a little bit concerned about what might happen with decoupling, right? And I don't think, and and like you started out by saying, um, we had weaponized interdependence before. It wasn't Trump. It didn't start with Trump. And it's not just the U.S. that has been using it. I would argue that it is also China, right? And I don't see any reason why the Chinese would stop using it because they have the uh, um, one of the presentations uh, that was made in an earlier presentation, which is that they do have the domestic uh, means to do it. And uh, and so if China continues to use weaponized interdependence, then the best case scenario for me at this point would be you get decoupling and within, so, and so there's sort of one, one one center is China and those within that that are part of its network and another one and in the other one we might be able to get um, a, a reduced form of weaponized interdependence uh, based on networks of trust and that was a point that uh, Marty Finnemore mentioned earlier on but between these two uh, systems I find it very hard to I think the genie is out of the bottle Famous last words. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you to the members of the audience who made a contribution. And please join me in a round of applause. And next is the conclusion. Yeah. Uh, so I guess Henry, Ava, and I should get up there. Tom and Rita, thank you very much. And I am really, really happy that the technology worked. Thank you. It's really impressive. We really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Without a flaw. Brad, thank you. I mean, really, seriously, applaud for the tech help on this.